I would like to welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are very excited after a year of work, we were able to publish uh, our position paper yesterday um, as a blog post on CC Medium channel. Um, as Bridget mentioned, I'm the lead of the uh, working group. And first, I would like to give a brief overview of this paper and then uh, hand over to uh, working group members Molly and Anna uh, to give us more detail. Um, first of all, as we all know, uh, our societies rely heavily on quality academic and scientific research and journals them to address common challenges and find solutions for a better future. Uh, while the value of research and journalism is widely recognized as a fundamental principle of, principle of free and democratic societies, recent legal developments have tended to undermine this principle and raise barriers to access to data, including publicly available data. And these uh, challenges could include copyright laws, uh, database rights, privacy, and data protection laws and alike. But today we will be uh, looking into the policy and legal landscapes in the European Union and the United States uh, on the access and use of publicly available data for researchers and journalists. And then we will present, present our recommendations uh, surrounding this issue, also to support better sharing of data in the public interest. Additionally, we also would like to use this webinar as an opportunity to call for more examples from other jurisdictions, but I will uh, discuss that further towards the end of the webinar. And with that said, I would like to give the, the floor to my colleague Anna Lozarova to present our EU law resource. And after Anna, Molly uh, Van Holling will be taking the floor to present our US law research. Over to you, Anna, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Emine. Uh, I'm going to talk about three main uh, uh, issues, let's say three, three main topics uh, in terms of um, the use of uh, publicly uh, accessible data. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about the personal data protection context of, uh, of this use. Uh, personal data, regardless of the fact that it might be publicly available or that it was shared by users voluntarily, falls within the scope of the GDPR. Uh, in, in, this, uh, in this sense, prin basic principles of data protection should be followed by the respective researchers or journalists. Where the extracted publicly available data constitutes personal data, there are some exceptions under GDPR that uh, a researcher might enjoy. Uh, first of all, under Article 14 of the GDPR, where personal data have not been obtained directly from the data subject, data controllers have the obligation to provide information to the data subject. Article uh, 14, uh, paragraph 5, and recital um, 62 uh, introduce an exception to the obligation to provide information. Uh, according to, our, uh, to paragraph 5, where the provisions of information to the data subject proves to be impossible or would involve a disproportionate effort, uh, in particular where processing is carried out by our archiving purpose, uh, for archiving purposes in the public interest, scientific on, or historical research purposes or statistical purposes. In such cases, the controller sh uh, shall take appropriate measures to protect the data subjects rights and freedoms and legitimate interests, including making the information publicly available. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, furthermore, Article 85 and Recital uh, 153 of the GDPR allow exceptions uh, for the processing of personal data solely for journalistic purposes uh, of the academic, artistic, and uh, literary expression. It's the obligation of member states to reconcile basically conflicting rights by national law. Next slide, please. Uh, it's important to note that Exceptions are not blanket or unconditional permissions for the use of publicly available data or the use of journalistic uh, and uh, for journalistic and research purposes. There are cases where organizations were fined for not fulfilling additional requirements of the regulation. For instance, the Biznot case uh, in Poland, the Polish DPA fined the company for scraping data for publicly uh, from publicly available resources. 
The DPA found that the fulfillment of the obligation of the controller to provide information did not require a disproportionate effort, and so the controller was not exempted of it. Uh, we also have the EU Desinfo Lab case where the Belgian DPA fined researchers for publishing raw data and political profiling of tweets in, in a disinformation analysis study without concluding, uh, conducting a data protection impact assessment. Uh, so overall, notwithstanding some uh, concessions that the GDPR may grant controllers which process publicly available personal data, or process data for specific public interest purposes, controllers are still obliged to take appropriate measures to protect the data subjects' rights and freedoms and legitimate interest, as well as follow the spirit of the regulation and the principles of data minimization and data protection by design and by default. Next slide, please, Emine. Uh, so now uh, the issue that is closest uh, to all our hearts, I believe, uh, copyright. <laughs> uh, so when we want to use publicly available materials, we must also assess if these materials are subject to copyright. In order for a work to attract copyright protection, it must be original in the sense that it must be the author's own intellectual cre creation. The originality threshold is relatively low, according to the InfoPAC uh, 1 uh, decision of the CJU. Uh, the, a text consisting of, a few, of as few as 11 consecutive words can constitute an original work. The court decides that an act occurring during a data capture process, which consists of uh, storing an exact uh, an extract of a protected work comprising 11 words and printing out this extract is such as to come within the concept of reproduction. <clears throat> now, in EU context, however, uh, we should be aware of the existence of the so-called related rights and also called neighboring rights. These rights are designed to economically incentivize some ancillary roles in the creative industries, production chains, such as producers and publishers. Currently, there are five types of related rights harmonized on EU level. These are um, discover uh, performances, phonograms, film fixations, broadcasts, and recently uh, also press publications. The requirement of originality does not extend to the subject matter protected by related rights. On the contrary, in some cases, copyright and related rights protection can overlap and create layers of protection over the same material. This is the case with the new press publishers, right, where uh, journalistic publications can be both the subject of copyright protection and protection over the press publication itself, which is unbound by the concept of, orig of originality. Furthermore, the EU, along with a few other jurisdictions, recognize the so-called sui generis database right. Uh, it's introduced by Article 7 of the Database Directive, according to which the maker of a database that shows that there have, has been a quantitatively or quant qualitatively a uh, substantial investment in uh, either, the, uh, either the obtaining, verification, or presentation of the content will enjoy protection. This is uh, another case of possible overlap of legal protection over the same material. Uh, we have some case law in this uh, uh, respect uh, in Ryanair versus PR Aviation. Uh, concerning screen scrapping, the court ruled that Ryanair uh, could not enjoy other co either, co either copyright or database protection as computer generated airline shadows don't meet the requirement of a substantial investment or originality. Next slide, please, Femine. Now, in terms of uh, legal opportunities to use protected works and databases, um, in, uh, in the benefit of public interest. There are several pre-existing copyright exceptions that can be potentially used for the purpose of uh, mining of publicly available information. Firstly, mining could fall under Article 511 of the InfoSoc Directive when the activity implies temporary acts of reproduction, 
which are transient or incidental and are integral part or an essential part of the technological process and have no independent economic significance. This possible, possible application of Article 511 uh, is expressly mentioned in Recital 18 of the CDSM Directive. Secondly, in some cases, Article 53A of the InfoSoc Directive can allow for mining when the activity is performed for research and non-commercial purposes. Thirdly, mining can be covered by Article 5.2b of the InfoSoc Directive, where it is affected by physical persons for personal use. This exception can possibly be combined with uh, the application of Article 5.3n of the InfoSoc Directive, which allows libraries to make uh, protected subject matter available to individual members of the public for research or private study. And lastly, uh, we have some exceptions in the database directive under Article 6.2b and 9b. Users can reproduce, uh, translate, adapt, arrange, distribute, communicate, and so on. Uh, the database's content for the purposes of illustration for teaching on, or scientific research. Uh, next slide, please, Emily. In 2019, recognizing the need for a more consistent approach, the Directive on Copyright of the Digital Single Market introduced, uh, we are all aware, to provisions dedicated to text and data, data mining specifically. First, we have Article 3 that provides a mandatory exception, which allows research organizations and cultural heritage organizations to make reproductions and extractions your, in order to carry out for the purposes of scientific research, text and data mining of works and other subject matter to which they have lawful access. Article 3 does not allow for contractual override or override by technical protection measures. Uh, nevertheless, the scope of beneficiaries is very restricted. Uh, and it basically uh, allows almost only non-commercial use of um, non-commercial research use. Additionally, Article 4 of the CDSM directive brings an exemption concerning both commercial and non-commercial uses by any user. However, rights holders are allowed to unilaterally block the use under the exception, uh, under the exception by res reserving their rights. Under recital uh, 18, sorry, of the CDSM directive, the rights holder should reserve the right to make reproductions and extraction for text and data mining in an appropriate manner. This is what the rest of says. In the case of content that has been made publicly available online, it should only be considered appropriate to reserve those rights by the use of machine readable means including metadata and terms and conditions of, of a website or a service. Notwithstanding the reservation regime, the application of this second exception under Article 4 is safeguarded against override by TPM as well. Uh, and finally, for both exceptions, they contain a requirement for the beneficiary to have lawful access to the respective materials as a prerequisite of the permitted use. This is a very specific term. The concept of lawful use and lawful source in EU acquis is a very complicated one. It requires, in order for the use uh, under the exceptions to be lawful, that the subject matter was made available with the consent of the rights holder. Now, although there is no express uh, legal definition for lawful access in the CDSM directive, uh, according to Recital 14, lawful access should also cover access to content that is freely available online. So hopefully uh, this term will be interpreted as broader than, than the term of lawful use according to the CJU case law. Uh, next slide, please, Emine. And finally, very briefly, I will, co uh, will comment on the uh, proposal for the Data Act. Uh, it is the second main proposal released last year as part of the European Strategy for Data, uh, following the Data Governance Act. 
The Data Act proposal covers the following main subject matter. First, mandatory access to data generated by connected devices. This means IoT devices, basically, by consumers, businesses, and public authorities. Secondly, data sharing when small and medium-sized enterprises are involved. And thirdly, data processing services, which means switching, international transfer of non-personal data, and interoperability. What we are most interested in the context of uh, the Data Act, um, in the context, sorry, of the use of publicly available data, is uh, Chapter 10 of the Data Act, which contains one, uh, only one article, Article 35. And according to, to this article, in order not to hinder the exercise uh, of rights under Article 4 and 5 of the proposal, uh, the sui generis right provided in the database directive does not apply to databases containing di data obtained from generate uh, obtained or from or generated by the use of a product and a related service, uh, which are which are uh, notions that are defined in the Data Act and basically mean uh, data generated. Uh, uh, by IoT devices. Now, open activists consider this solution to be a missed opportunity since there was a clear expectation for the Data Act to completely revise the database directive in terms of the scope of the sui generis database, right? But there's still time for that because uh, there is still time to, to revise the proposal. And uh, I, I believe I have to wrap up and uh, I hope that I didn't uh, uh, didn't take too much time, and uh, <laughs> I, I'll be giving the floor to Molly. Thanks. Thanks so much, Anna. And I'm glad you took the time you needed because the landscape in the European Union certainly is complicated, and I'm so grateful uh, for your roadmap for us. The situation in the United States is in some ways murky, as I will describe, but it has maybe not quite so many complicated moving parts. I'm just going to talk about really two things under US federal law, and then I'll allude to some possible complications under state law in the United States. So one source of law that has caused anxiety to academic researchers and to journalists who've been accessing publicly available data from platforms like Facebook and LinkedIn, for example, uh, for purposes of research, one source of anxiety has been the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Now, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, it's, it's quite old at this point and seems to have been enacted really to fight against computer hacking, breaking into other people's computers for nefarious purposes, and it includes both civil and criminal remedies. But the touchstone of the law is about unauthorized access to network computers. And so sometimes owners of network computers have argued that when someone comes to their server that serves up publicly available data, but uses that data, in ways that go beyond the preferences of the server owner, that that access is unauthorized because it goes farther than the authorization. And this theory has been tried in several cases and it has posed a potential chilling effect on researchers. But the case law in the United States in recent years, influenced in part by a recent Supreme Court case and including a Ninth Circuit case from as recently as 2022, has tended to be of the opinion that the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act should not be read so broadly to cover use of publicly available data that merely goes beyond the preferences of a platform owner. I have in mind, for example, this Ninth Circuit case from 2022, HQ Labs versus LinkedIn, where the court rejected LinkedIn's claim under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, saying the concept of without an authorization under the CFAA does not apply to public websites. If you made stuff publicly available, that's basically authorization. And you can't then apply filters to say, well, you are authorized, but you weren't authorized or you've gone too far. 
the court goes on to say something about its rationale and what it's concerned about. What would be the problem of giving companies like LinkedIn the ability to limit access to what is otherwise held out there for public use on their web servers? The court said giving companies like LinkedIn free reign to decide on any basis who can collect and use data, data that the companies do not own. This, of course, is the user data that they otherwise make publicly available to viewers and that the companies themselves collect and use risks the possible creation of information monopolies that would disserve the public interest. So the companies shouldn't be able to basically kind of create handmade case by case intellectual property rights through the use of permission slips on their otherwise publicly available servers, at least so far as the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is concerned. I think generally this has been seen as good news for researchers and journalists because, as I mentioned, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act includes criminal penalties, so it really did have quite a large, powerful prospect of chilling access to publicly available data. On the next slide, I'll turn to my other topic under U.S. law, and that is copyright law. So like Anna, I'll remind you of a few basics of copyright law in the United States. Copyright law does not extend to mere facts, but it does extend to original compilations of facts. So if you've organized a bunch of factual material in an original way, you can get protection for that. We don't have sui generis database protection in the United States, but we do have this protection for compilations of data that are put together in an original way. Now, I should note a caveat that even though a database qualifies for copyright protection under this original compilation idea, that protection in the United States does not extend to the data itself. It only extends to the original way in which the data was put together. So if data is put together in an original way and a third party comes in, extracts all of the individual pieces of data and organizes them in a different way, they have not not violated the copyright under US law because it only extends to the organization, not to the pieces of data themselves. Now, of course, copyright also applies to expressive works like books, for example, in which facts can be embedded. This has implications for research activity like text and data mining, because often people want to manipulate these expressive works like books in various ways in order to extract unprotected data about those works. But sometimes doing so involves making a copy of the entire work. And so copyright can be implicated in these cases. However, when I say cop copyright can be implicated, I don't mean that there is necessarily a copyright violation when expressive works are copied for purpose of text and data mining. And that's because a series of cases under the fair use doctrine in the United States have suggested that even copying entire works can be fair use if the copying was done for this purpose of extracting and then even publishing not the works themselves, but merely data about the works. And so, for example, some of these cases involve the Google Book Search project where Google scanned entire books for purposes of enabling a search engine that provided only little snippets of information about the book and the information that the book in fact satisfied the search query. And courts have said that that kind of activity, copying a work in order to provide information about the work, just the kind of thing that researchers do through text and data mining, that that can be fair use. And so legal experts who are really concerned with the future of text and data mining feel good about these precedents and the prospect that fair use will protect that activity. And so I'd say the trend in general in the United States is towards breaking down some of these potentially chilling barriers to research and journalistic use of publicly available data. Some of the chilling effect of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act has been limited by recent cases, and the prospect of fair use is also a limitation on the chilling effect of the Copyright Act. 
I have just a couple more slides on the United States. Uh, in my next one, I'll note that there are some potential lurking complications. So there are some theories under state law as opposed to federal law that might still be available to object to research use that in particular violates the terms of use of a publicly available website. So that could amount to a breach of contract for example, and it's not clear, there's nothing expressed of the type that Anna uh, summarized under EU law. There's nothing expressed in US law that says, for example, fair use rights are protected from contractual override. Some scholars think that they should be, that the Copyright Act should be understood to preempt state law contract law where it would prevent people from doing things that fair use seems to privilege, but the cases have not universally embraced that idea. So there is the potential for contractual override. And I should also mention override by technological protection measures, which Anna's slides reminded me that I should have included here as well. There's another theory under state law known as trespass to chattels. So if you're not familiar with this, it's I find it a kind of quaint and charming uh, idea. So trespass to land is of course, going over the physical border of someone's land and occupying their land. Trespass to chattels is ba basically occupying people's things that is not taking away their things, but meddling with them in some way. So uh, an example that's often given is unauthorized petting of someone's dog. That could be trespass to chattels, except that typically trespass to chattels requires as an element of the cause of action that you prove actual harm to your thing. So if I didn't hurt the dog, then petting it even without authorization is not trespass to chattels, even though trespass to land often operates quite strictly, even if you don't do any damage, just crossing the boundary line can be enough. But harm is generally required for trespass to chattels. And in some of the cases about unauthorized access to computer servers, courts have rejected trespass to chattels causes of action where there was in fact no harm. Someone was maybe sending unauthorized emails, but they didn't overwhelm the servers or break anything. Courts have rejected the idea that that's trespass to chattels. And so I think there's some prospect that this will not impose an insufferable burden on researchers or journalists either. My final slide is just a summary of what I've said so far, that the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and the Copyright Act in the United States have increasingly been interpreted in favor of research use of publicly available information, even where that research entails making copies of entire expressive works. But other sources of liability may continue to chill research. And frankly, I think this is maybe an opportunity in the United States too, to think about some more clear affirmative rights for this type of access to publicly available data of the type that folks are pushing for in Europe as well. That's all I have on the United States. I think I'm going to pass it over to m &A to talk about some of our thoughts about the future. Thank you so much, Anna and Molly. This was very informative. I also would like to briefly summarize what we have uh, discussed so far before we move on to our uh, recommendations. Um, as you can see uh, from the e from EU and US law research and uh, navigating the legal landscape for the use of uh, publicly available data by researchers and journalists can be difficult and complex. And we found in the position paper that the findings uh, highlight that there are legal safeguards in place, but there are also a number of legal barriers that can limit the access and use of data in both jurisdictions. And these barriers can have a chilling effect on public interest research and journalism and restrict fundamental rights such as freedom of access to information and freedom to share. And for that reason, and to overcome these challenges, uh, we identified four main recommendations in our position paper, also to enable unchilled public interest research and journalism access to data. The first recommendation uh, is uh, to give individuals who generate data the ability to control and share that data freely with third parties. Additionally, we suggest that uh, privacy concerns uh, should be balanced against the rights uh, to freedom of expression, access to information, press freedom, and academic research, and a proportional uh, balance should be established where exemptions are granted for academic research and journalism in the public interest. 
And we also recommend that researchers and journalists should not face unnecessary barriers in using citizen data when they conduct their activities with a duty of care. We suggest that this duty of care should be established under a standardized approach set forth by law to avoid frivolous litigation. And lastly, we recommend that legal instruments should solidify the rights of researchers and journalists uh, to use publicly available data providing clear guidance on any applicable restrictions as well. Uh, to conclude, uh, the, in this position paper, we try to emphasize the significance of data intensive research and journalism in the public interest. And we believe that by following these recommendations, we can at least ensure that legal barriers do not impede these activities and the society as a whole can benefit from the wealth of knowledge and information that is available through publicly available data. And of course, our uh, discussion doesn't end here, fortunately, uh, because we want to continue this conversation and learn more about the barriers you may be facing in your own jurisdictions. And that's why we want to hear from you. And if you are aware of any barriers uh, to access uh, to publicly available data for research, research or journalism, please reach out to us at info at creativecommons.org. Uh, you can also see the email address on the slide. Uh, we really would like to uh, hear uh, from you and uh, we would be very happy if you could share your experiences with us, tell us about challenges you are facing and help us to understand the situation uh, in your uh, respective jurisdictions. And with that, I think we conclude the presentation part of our webinar, but I would like to ask if Anna, Molly, or Bridget would like to add anything else, if there is anything I'm forgetting. Okay, then in that case, uh, I hope you found this webinar helpful and engaging, and we would be very happy to receive your questions uh, in this, let, let's say, next 15 to 20 minutes. Please feel free to unmute yourselves uh, to ask a question. You can also ask your questions in the chat. I will also stop sharing my screen so we can. I would be very curious if we have folks in the audience, I know in fact that we have some, uh, who practice in jurisdictions outside the United States or Europe, um, what the legal landscape is like there and what obstacles researchers and journalists find to researching using publicly available data. And they please feel free to uh, tell us your experiences because we wanted to start this uh, research as like the preliminary version uh, of uh, this uh, research then to extend on other jurisdictions. Right now we only have US and EU, but we would like to have more of a geographical coverage as well. Andre, please go ahead. Yes, thank you for the presentation. It was great to hear from you. Uh, yes, and answering to Molly's question, here from Brazil had a very interesting uh, experience, let's say, concerning researchers and journalists, uh, data protection and copyright in the last four years during the last government, Bolsonaro's government, in which you saw many times that copyright and data, uh, both copyright and data protection, personal data protection, were often used to deny access to public information. So it was, it, it was part of a more a broader array of instruments used to deny public access to, to information that should be accessed publicly. We had a very interesting, interesting experience here in which there was a public consultation made to reform the copyright law. And uh, the contributions made to this public consultation procedures were made available to the public because of some personal data concerns. Even though there were really personal data, they were like many times they were 
data from companies from I don't know, Google, Facebook, major uh, enterprises, and they were denying this access to this information based on data protection. So I think there are many experiences to share from Brazil with just uh, mentioning that, uh, yes, we see many times that both copyright and data protection serve as uh, obstacles to researchers and to journalists here. Thank you all. That is really ironic, use of copyright to constrain public access to debates about copyright. Indeed, thank you so much for sharing. Andre, anyone else would like to share or ask anything? Hello, um, can you hear me? Yes, yes please, please go ahead. So I'm in Switzerland, which is um, not in, in Europe. We are not subject to European directives, even if we are a lot in contact with um, Europe. So we have to be in line with uh, European directives. In fact, we have a new data protection federal law, which will enter into force at the end of this year, 2023, uh, because we have to get in, in line with a new with a GDPR. And so we are very similar to the GDPR in concerning data protection. Um, I have nothing new to say about Swiss law. Concerning copyright, um, we have very good exceptions, very clear exceptions. Uh, we have good um, quotation rights. So in the doctrine, it is also said that we can um, copy a full image. For example, this is the main issue copying or um, reproducing a full image as a quotation when the conditions are fulfilled, of course, so when it serves as explanation of a work, etc. But in certain countries, they don't recognize uh, the quotation of, of an image. And when you only quote part of an image, it doesn't make sense. So this is the main issue. And here in Switzerland, I think on a more theoretical level, uh, we are in a good position, but concretely, um, I, there were no cases in, uh, in court where it happened that at school or for research, uh, there was a copying or a reproduction of a full image and that was denied. So it's more on a theoretical level, it's more an acceptance, I'm, I think we are not to that point yet in a practical, concrete, jurisprudential level. Uh, hopefully, um, we will have a good uh, decision code so to, to, to have a future, to have like a, a, a one case uh, to be developed. Um, what else can I say? Also data mining, uh, there is a new data mining exception which entered into force uh, 2020 which permits um, the, the, the reproduction of a full work, as you have already explained, uh, for research purposes, uh, when it is not possible to use other means. So when it is not possible to avoid the system and uh, when it only um, remain within the research team. So it's the results of the research will not be published with the full work, of course. Um, so we have, good exceptions, clear. Sometimes I think that the USA FAIR um, principles may adapt more the situation because they're not so clear, they're not so uh, defined. So on, on one side, it can be more uncertain, that it can lead to more certainty, but on the other side, um, we, we are so strictly um, dependent on these exceptions and the exact limits of the and the conditions of these exceptions. Sometimes there are certain cases that may go a little bit um, beyond or maybe a little bit more particular. And it's like, we don't know what to do because it's, um, there are there is still uncertainty. So yeah, this is from the Swiss point of view. Thank you so much, Susanna. I actually have a question for you. Sure. Uh, with the tax and data mining exception you mentioned, uh, you said if there are no other means to do their research, so how, how do they need to prove that they have no other means? 
That's a good question, yeah. Um, I think because it's a new law which entered into force in 2020, we still need jurisdiction to, to, to decide or to give these details, uh, to give the solutions about these details. For now, uh, we only have the law, which is still pretty much general and abstract. And we will see in, later on how it will be developed on a practical level, concrete. No, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, of course, you always need to apply the main principles. So uh, reasonable way to find new uh, other ways of other means, um, pro proportionality. Apart from these principles, we will see cases that will be um, that will emerge with time. Thank you so much. I mean, if you actually come across a case in the next few years, yeah. please let oh, us know because that would be interesting, interesting to look into. Yeah, yeah. It's very interesting to compare these different uh, laws and jurisdictions. We also have a very good freedom of panorama. Also, this in Switzerland, we don't have like, for example, certain countries. I know Italy and Greece, they have the a protection of um, cultural heritage, so not only copyright, but also, so we don't have, it's, we are completely free to make, uh, to take pictures and to use also for commercial purposes, pictures of um, works that are on an accessible street, accessible uh, street, even if the work itself is still protected by copyright. That's very interesting indeed. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Susanna? I have a comment actually. This is fascinating, the, the additional restriction that you mentioned uh, uh, concerning the text of data mining exception. I would say it's a very serious restriction. I mean, you, you have to exhaust every other way to... Uh, uh, it, it's even more of a restriction than a possibility to have contractual override over the exception, I'd say. And I also think it's a very good, makes a very good case for strategic litigation, if you're interested in that. Uh, because uh, I would say it uh, pretty much is able to hinder the exercise of uh, the right to research in this yeah. case. Because it's a fallback exception that uh, kicks in when you have no other avenue at all. Uh, you yeah. have exhausted uh, all, uh, all avenues of uh, searching for licensing and so on and so forth. Yeah. And it makes it a very, very, very restrictive exception, I'd say. So it would be interesting to see how, how this one would be developed, uh, play yes. out. It's always about finding the balance between, on one side, not to make unfair competition with uh, right holders and who sells uh, the sellers of works, and on the other side, being free to use uh, protected work. It's always finding the balance. So on one side, yes, okay, if really you need to, uh, to do text and data mining, you can, but if it's still possible to not to reproduce entire work, but it's still, you, you should buy the work. That's the point. Thank you very much for your for this no, for the possibility so to compare. This, this this is very interesting, especially knowing that like Switzerland is not part of the EU, but they might have similar legislation, but still not not the same. This is actually a very interesting uh, perspective. Thank you yeah. so much. Very generous audience participation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And anyone else would like to share uh, or ask anything? I think in that case, we can slowly start wrapping up and maybe uh, remind that we are still looking forward to hear from you regarding your experiences in your jurisdictions, because we really would like the conversation to be broader than what we presented today. Um, and I am sure also maybe Molly, Anna and Bridget would like to add something.
question before we wrap up. Emily, I want to thank you for being our brilliant and tireless leader and Bridget for overseeing all of the copyright platform work and Anna for bringing so much knowledge about the European Union and Susanna and Andre for contributing on the spot information about their own jurisdictions. Um, this has been a real pleasure and this kind of work with other members of the CC network is so informative and rewarding. So thank you very much for including me in it. And I should say thanks to Kat also for working behind the scenes to make sure that everything went smoothly. I, I would add my voice uh, to this chorus uh, of, uh, of Molly and, and Emine to, to thank you for all your wonderful work within the group. Um, a lot of work has gone into this. The presentation was so well done that it all seemed so simple and obvious, but there was a lot of research and analysis in the background. And so I want to underscore how uh, impressive your, your contribution has been to, to the field and how your ideas and your recommendations can really help shape the future of access to data for research and journalism. So it's, it's really, really um, important to to recognize all this uh, this wonderful contribution. I think that, as you say, you want to hear more about what will happen in other jurisdictions, but I think your work will also probably influence what happens. I'm, uh, I'm confident that it will have a, a big impact. So thank you very much for all your work throughout the year. Um, I know that the, the paper is available, but we'll also make the recording of this webinar available. So this will be a permanent resource that people can um, can go to 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 find out uh, to find out about the the status of uh, access to data right now and how this can be improved for the future. So thank you very much. But I'll leave the last word to you, Amine, as a lead to to, to close us off. Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, would you like to add anything or? <laughs> you don't have time to well, I will just uh, like to, to briefly thank, uh, thank everyone as well. And especially Emine, Molly and Bridget. Uh, um, I feel like your contribution is much more important than mine. You've been working on this very hard and uh, congratulations. I think the result is uh, impressive. And I would like to thank uh, to all of you because it's been a real pleasure working with you all and also uh, uh, hearing from the community members as well. Uh, indeed, uh, we uh, worked hard on this for the uh, last year, but I'm very happy with the results, but this is only the beginning. We will have better results as well, I hope so. And thank you so much. And thank you so much for everyone in the uh, audience for tuning in today and listening to our presentation. I hope you all have a nice day, evening, wherever you are. Thank you. Take care, everyone.